Raja Faisal in Delhi. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. There you sit in India's capital, but I'm sure your thoughts are with the people of Kashmir. What are the latest reports you are hearing of what is happening in your home territory in terms of the curfew and the lockdown? Because the Indian authorities say they've begun to gradually ease it. It's the eighth day of uh, curfew and uh, the news which I am getting from Kashmir is that it continues to be the same. Around 8 million people continue to be under incarceration. Roads are deserted. Markets are closed. It's very hard to move around. The communication system is completely down. Telephone lines are not working. Mobile phones. People who are living outside Kashmir have not been able to talk to their families for the last eight days. There is shortage of food materials. People are not able to figure out what's happening. There has been absolute clampdown on the protests and the presence of security forces has been unprecedented. It's a warlike situation. People are unable to reach out to their relatives. Political leaders are under you know, arrest and all political leaders. The surprising part of this crackdown has been that pro-India as well as the separatist leadership, all of them are under arrest this time. It's a situation, a scene completely out of a partition novel. Well, you say that uh, all local politicians in Kashmir are, are under arrest or facing intimidation, and yet, of course, you're speaking to me from Delhi, and I happen to know that in the last week you have been able to go to Srinagar uh, and attend political meetings. So it suggests to me that perhaps you're exaggerating the extent of the control from India just a little bit. Most of uh, the political leaders who belong to my political party and all other political parties have been detained. Uh, I am the only person from the all-party meeting which met there in Srinagar on 4th who is free and honestly speaking, I'm ashamed of myself that I'm free at a time when the entire leadership of Kashmir is under, you know, uh, in jail and all the 8 million people have been imprisoned. Do you think, in all honesty, when uh, this interview is done and perhaps over the next few days you will try to go back uh, to Kashmir, do you think you will be free for long? Police has come to my home a couple of times after I left and it's also a story in itself the way I reached airport and, and came to Delhi. Uh, because of communication breakdown, maybe people could not communicate uh, to their higher-ups about my escape from the airport, but I am very much apprehensive that soon after I leave from here I may be detained, like anybody else. You uh, are the leader of the Jammu and Kashmir People's Movement, obviously one of quite a number of different political parties in Kashmir. What is your message both to your own party supporters and to the wider public? Do you want to see people take to the streets and try to resist what you have called India's occupation? I mean, uh, if you look at what has happened on 5th of August is that the entire political mainstream, people like me who believed in electoral politics and who saw some sort of resolution coming within the framework of Indian constitution, I mean, we people have been rendered without an argument. Most of the leaders, including two former chief ministers, are under arrest this time. So when you talk about the mobilization, it has been impossible for people to mobilize protests in the last one week because of unprecedented security presence in Kashmir. But I'm aware that there are going to be spontaneous eruptions in Kashmir the moment restrictions are relaxed a little bit. And people like me and all entire leadership which is in Kashmir, I'm not sure if anybody's call is going to be heeded or listened to. But uh, it seems you are calling for calm because I, I saw this... Uh, quote from you just the other day, you say the government seems to be preparing for casualties numbering eight to 10,000. Sanity demands that we don't give anyone a chance for a massacre. My appeal is that we should all stay alive and then we shall fight back. So for right now, you're telling people to stay home. I think this is a, this is a sign of majority of the people. 200,000 security forces out to kill anybody who is going to raise a voice of dissent. 
So I think this is a sign of maturity that people are not reacting the way. But I am sure that Kashmiris will give a more calibrated, more seasoned, long-term, organic, sustainable response to what has been done by Indian state. This, this act of indignation which has been done to the people of Kashmir, I am sure this will not go unprotested. This, uh, this decision by the Indian government to revoke Article 370 to end the special autonomous status of Kashmir, it can hardly have been a surprise to you. After all, Mr Modi's BJP party has put it into their manifesto for many elections and after their thumping win in the last election, it was speculated by many that this time they had a mandate to do it. The surprise is that India claims to be itself the greatest democracy in the world and in spite of Modi being there in this country, we believe that there are institutions of democracy which will protect the constitution. So the biggest surprise this time is the way it has been done. If you look at the constitutional history of the state, if you look at how the narrative around Article 370 has developed in the last 70 years, I think all the jurists in this country have been of one opinion that it's impossible to revoke these guarantees following the constitutional procedure. So today what has been done is by resorting to complete illegality, by completely murdering the constitution in the house of people of this country, that's something which surprises. Otherwise we always knew that BJP wanted to abolish these protections as part of the larger agenda of Akhand Bharat or maybe having a Hindutva kind of a philosophy in this country. But the way it was done, broad daylight, constitution was murdered by these people, these two supermen who have come to rule this country. I think that is something which has surprised everybody who had faith or who believed that India is the greatest democracy in the world. But what about my point about a democratic mandate? After all, this uh, Jammu and Kashmir reorganization bill just sailed through the Indian Parliament. In the lower house, it won a majority of 370 to 72. And as you are a self-professed Democrat, surely that does represent a mandate. That does represent the mandate, but Parliament is not there to demolish the principles of democracy. Parliamentarian cannot become a voice for the majority. That's our problem. Who will then represent the minority populations of this country? Minority, it's, it's like when, when you talk about diversity in India, it is tremendous. It's 1.3 billion people being represented in that house of people. Our problem is that when parliament resorts to unconstitutional methods, what has been done to Jammu and Kashmir today can be done to any other state tomorrow. So if parliament is out to demolish the federal structure of this country, that is something which I believe the parliament doesn't have the mandate for. And you will also uh, uh, must take notice that the Supreme Court of India has laid down a doctrine of basic structure of the constitution. That there are certain things which the parliament can also not change. And we believe that these articles, Article 370, Supreme Court has laid it down, that these articles are in itself so, so part you, of that basic structure so, which the parliament cannot change. So Mr. Faisal, I guess the logic of your position is that this will end up in the Supreme Court. And I know that there are various legal challenges to the revocation decision which are going to head toward the Supreme Court. But let's face it, the court today has issued a ruling saying that it won't intervene in the imposition of the curfew and the lockdown. It says that the government has every right over the next few weeks to impose this policy and to let things stabilize. So uh, it's not clear the court's going to be on your side. If the parliament represents the majoritarian sentiment that we hope then courts should represent the minority sentiment, that's our understanding. As of now, we are about to challenge these articles. Some of the political parties have already filed their petitions. I know it's going to be a long battle. It's not going to be easy for the Supreme Court also to undo what a majoritarian government, a bully government has done in this country. I know it's going to be hard for Supreme Court justices to stand for the cause of truth. You, you make your passionate points about the Constitution, but is there not a way of looking at this which is much more pragmatic and technocratic? And you yourself, I think, pride yourself on being something of a technocrat. Mr. Modi makes the point that by imposing a form of 
of direct rule, let's face it, direct rule from Delhi to Jammu and Kashmir, he says there will be a lot more development. All citizens will be guaranteed their rights, but he says there'll be new investment in infrastructure. The people of Jammu and Kashmir will have more opportunities, more jobs, and in the long run, it will benefit the people. I think this is a completely mischievous narrative that has been built around uh, abolishing of Article 370. If you look at India, which is now 28 states, Jammu and Kashmir state has developmental indicators better than many of such states. If you look at the levels of equality in Jammu and Kashmir this time, if you look at longevity, if you look at the GDP per capita, if you look at the total fertility rates and other demographic indicators, it might surprise the people that Jammu and Kashmir has better indicators than all many such states which do not have such protections. Article 370 was responsible it was the protection basically for very successful land reforms which took place in the state of Jammu and Kashmir and such land reforms have not been done anywhere else in the country. But if I may say so, I, it was also, sorry to interrupt, but Article 370 also in a sense ring-fenced some deeply sexist uh, policies and, and uh, constitutional uh, realities in Jammu and Kashmir and, and as, as Mr. Modi has said, he hopes that people will see see that, for example, the Kashmir Permanent Residence Law, which your Jammu and Kashmir state had imposed, bars female residents from property rights in the event that they marry a person from outside the state. And, and Mr. Modi makes the point that's not right. And by imposing direct rule, that women law will has benefit. Been an evolving law. I must, that has been an evolving law and over a period of last so many years, there has been a constant debate in Jammu and Kashmir that we need to give those protections, those rights to women and the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir has already settled that matter and those protections, those rights have been extended to the women who marry non-state subjects from Jammu and Kashmir. I can tell you that we had been constantly telling the government of India that leave it to the leadership of Jammu and Kashmir, leave it to the, to the state assembly, the state assembly is going to correct all those anomalies if they are there. I can tell you with, with complete confidence that all these excuses are being now raised because the larger agenda of assailing the special identity of the state, changing the demographics of the state, attacking the constitutional protections which were always you know, part of the BJP's agenda of one Vidhan, one Pradhan and one Samvidhan which is that we want only one constitution, one flag, one symbol, one president, one prime minister in this country. That idea of monarchy monochromatic lack of diversity idea of BJP where it doesn't really respect minorities, doesn't respect a diversity, doesn't respect multiple cultures, mainly has extreme contempt from anything that's related to Muslims. I think that's something which was being used. Yeah, well, I, my question then is, where do you go from here, Mr. Faisal? Because, as I say, you had a reputation that when you formed your party of being a pragmatist, a technocrat, you'd worked at the senior level in the Indian civil service for many years yourself. You argued against separatism and for creating a political space for dialogue. That space seems to have disappeared. That space has disappeared, not for us, but for everybody else. And, you know, people like me who wanted to find some meaning in electoral politics, who believed that some sort of resolution to this dispute is still available within the framework of Indian Constitution, I think all those people have been slapped on 5th August. And people like me now understand that there are only two ways to do politics in Kashmir. You will either have to be a stooge, or you will have to be a separatist. Everybody who now wants to champion the larger political rights of Kashmiri people, I'm sure the trajectory, the path for them has changed and the methodology has changed. I mean, now I think if people have been asking for right to self-determination, I think that framework is the only framework now which people will be so, ready to listen to. They will not be ready to listen to anything which is within the framework of the Constitution. So which is it for you, Mr. Faisal? Are you going to be stooge or separatist? I think it's too early for all of us. I am not going to be a stooge. I think one clarity which this step has brought into all of us is that those people who believed that India would not betray this generation of Kashmiris, you know, my grandfather's generation, 
when in 1953 the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir was handcuffed by a very small level police constable, my grandfather's generation got alienated and they got betrayed. And my father's generation in 1987 when the elections were held in the Jammu and Kashmir state and the elections were rigged, my, gener my father's generation, they got betrayed that time and that demolished the democratic institutions and the democratic methodology and we saw eruption of militancy in Kashmir in 1988. You know, this new insult, this new phase of indignation has begun on 5th August 2019 and it's my generation which has now got the taste of betrayal and I'm, I'm, I don't know how this is going to play out in next 50 to 70 years. You, you, it's going to be a new phase. Yeah. yeah, you said something very interesting earlier. You said you felt something of a sense of shame for the fact that you were not arrested, that you're still free when so many of your fellow Kashmiris, certainly in politics, have been detained. Do you also feel a sense of shame that for so many years you were an insider inside the Indian civil service arguing that uh, it was less important to pursue a path of separatism, more important to concentrate on things like supplying clean water, infrastructure, development. Do you think you got it wrong? Do you think ultimately I do. you are I part think, of the I think problem? I have to confess today before the world that we were, telling to, we were trying to sell a wrong product to people of Kashmir and we have been snubbed on 5th August 2019 when this unilateral assault on the constitutional identity of the state was done without taking any of the stakeholders on board by resorting to complete military might and suppressing the voices of the people in Kashmir and you know Modi just got his way through just bulldozed his way through into Kashmir without caring for what Kashmiris would think about this. So what's it to be now Mr. Faisal? If you're no longer prepared to be you know, in your own word, a stooge, and moderation appears to be impossible in the Kashmir of today. Are you going to back the militants? You know, we've already seen uh, key militant players who have strong links in Pakistan. I'm thinking of Mulana Abdulaziz, the, the guy who was a prayer leader in the Red Mosque in Islamabad. He's now said jihad is obligatory for Muslims in Pakistan because our Kashmiri brothers and sisters are waiting for our help. Is that the sort of language you can now identify with? The way voices of political moderation have been silenced in Kashmir, I'm extremely worried that it will give credence to the extremist elements and extreme ideologies are going to flourish in our part of the world. But when it comes to myself, I believe that a sustained, non-violent political mass movement will have to be launched in Kashmir. It may take a lot of time, but my belief in non-violence stems from the fact that most of the political movements in, in, in the rest of the world have succeeded as long as they have been non-violent. And I believe that we are going to fight for the rights of the people. It's going to take time, but Kashmiris have now found clarity in their politics, and I think we are going to make it one day. But just to be clear with me, would you today, despite everything we've discussed of your history, describe yourself as a Kashmiri separatist? I think I would not like myself to be boxed in these terminologies because finally it has been the government of India or the Indian narrative over Kashmir that these are mainstream people and these are separatist people. If you talk about legitimacies, who are the people who have the people's legitimacy? Even till now, separatists are those people who do not want to be boxed within the framework of Indian constitution. They had the larger number of people with them. So effectively, they were the political mainstream and people like us were not the political mainstream. So this entire vocabulary of politics, I think, has now changed in Kashmir. But maybe there will be a vocabulary like resolutionists and those people who are who now want to be stats coasts. I think I would want to be identified with the resolutionists, people well, who want to see peace in Kashmir. If yeah. I may say so, that's a bit abstract, but let me make it deeply personal. I, I believe I'm right in saying your own father was killed uh, by militants, separatist militants, because he refused to help them at a particular point. 
you therefore and your family have reasons to be suspicious of the separatist militant movement, but do you fear that Kashmir may return to the blood-soaked era of the 1980s and 1990s when we saw so much violence inside Kashmir? More than 100,000 people have died in Kashmir in the last 30 years. Thousands of people got displaced, including minority Kashmiri pundits. My worry is that if Kashmir slips back to early 90s, we will see another phase of bloodshed. Three generations have already got destroyed. I do not want to see few more generations getting destroyed. I just hope that like Japanese, Kashmiris will also now go back to their resiliency, stand up, rebuild their houses, rebuild their ideas, rebuild their hearts and minds, rebuild whatever has been lost and lost. You know, this has been more like a nuclear catastrophe for all of us. Well, let, let, let me end. sound... Yeah, sorry, but let, we don't have much time. Let me end with thoughts about the international arena. Uh, Imran Khan, Prime Minister of Pakistan, has compared what the Indians have done to Nazism. We have heard much less from the international community, the United States, the UK, many other countries have been remarkably silent about what India has done. Are you therefore reliant on help from Pakistan or do you believe you may get support from the wider world? I am extremely disappointed with the way international community has responded to this issue. People have to understand that Kashmir is, it's, a, you know, it's, it's three nuclear powers claiming right to this territory. It's a nuclear flashpoint. It's about a CAG. And this cannot be left unattended. Any sort of aggression by any of these three states can lead to a nuclear war in this region. We just hope that the entire international community will rise up to the occasion and take notice of the human rights violations which are happening in Kashmir due to this unprecedented curfew which has been placed and the unconstitutional act which has been done in the Parliament of India in recent times. On, on the specific point about Pakistan, India of course consistently accuses the Pakistani government of interfering, meddling, of sponsoring terrorism inside Kashmir. Do you believe that the climate is now right for Pakistan to actually play more of a role inside Kashmir. Will there be Kashmiris looking for Pakistani help? I think Pakistan has behaved like an international NGO uh, about this entire issue, wringing its hands and showing tremendous amounts of helplessness when it comes to dealing with this issue. I, we have always hoped that India and Pakistan could sit together and resolve this issue. India and Pakistan had 70 years to figure this out among themselves. Now that they have not, I think it's the job of the international community to come in and help these two belligerent neighbors to make peace with each other and at the same time recognize that the primacy and, and the primary stakeholders of this dispute are the people of Kashmir and the voices of Kashmir need to be heard. It has always been that the narratives about Kashmir are mixed with the narratives about Pakistan, about India. I think it's about time that people recognize that Kashmiris have deserve to have the agency over their future and the voices about, of Kashmiris need to be heard. Shah Faisal, we have to end there, but I thank you very much indeed for joining me from Delhi. Thank you very much.